welcome you all to our service today for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And I hope you have your singing voices on today. This is the fifth Sunday of the month, so we have our favorite hymns today, and you picked all the hymns for this morning. So uh, we didn't even get all of them in the bulletin. There were so many that were picked, but I hope we got at least uh, a good amount for all of you who have picked hymns that uh, you have some of your <coughs> favorite hymns that we sing today. The idea, again, is our reliance upon Jesus as the Savior. That's been the theme throughout the last several gospel lesson stories. Well, it's always the theme, actually, our reliance upon God for all things. But especially in regards to his generous and his gracious nature today. Those will be the thoughts that are reflected in our lessons. This morning, we don't follow an order of service. We are singing uh, the hymns and using them as the different parts of the liturgy. So we begin this morning then in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first hymn, hymn number 256. <laughs>
Our second hymn is our confession of sins this morning as we recognize that we have fallen short of the glory of God and need his help and forgiveness. So we join together in confessing our sins in the hymn 397.
that we hear the voice of our Lord as we turn our attention to our scripture lessons for the day. Again, they highlight the aspect that our God is abundant in his grace, he is generous, and also looks for that generosity in his own people. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15, where the Lord in his grace provides for the children of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness with food he provides for them. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. Our epistle lesson for the day, the second lesson is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the ninth chapter beginning at verse 8. We saw how the Lord was generous to his Old Testament people in the Old Testament times and in his grace provided for them, even though they grumbled against him and often complained. Paul points out that as we faithful people look to our Lord in that faith and see how generous he has been with us and we respond in the rich measure of generosity, again, that is a measure of God's grace as he works that within our lives. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving <coughs> to God. Here ends the word of our Lord from the epistle. And in response to our first two lessons, we join in the singing of our next hymn, 440. <laughs>
gospel lesson for the day on which we base our meditation is going to be from Mark chapter 6, verses 35 to 44. And in between the different parts of the sermon today, we'll be singing some more of the hymns that you have chosen. But first of all, a lesson from Mark 6. Now this again is a continuation of the lesson over the last several Sundays. Uh, Jesus is about, oh, let's see, about a year from his passion at this time, from his suffering, death, and resurrection. So he's getting his disciples ready for that and to carry on by themselves. And the crowd is more and more aware of him and his abilities, you might say. Some good, some not seeing it so good. Anyway, from Mark chapter 6, a story you're familiar with. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away, that is the crowds, to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now, what a great story that is. A great account of our Savior. In fact, this is the only story outside of the suffering, death, and resurrection that is recorded by all four of the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, that says something about this being important. So what is God telling us here? I was surprised when I read this past week what someone else used as an explanation of the importance of this account. And this is what that person said. This is the good news, that God intends for each of us to be filled to overflowing with what really we need most, love and a sense of purpose, so much so that we cannot help but share it with each other. Now, when I read that, I scratched my head. I do agree that we have this need for God's love and share that love and purpose with others. But when he said God wants us to be filled to overflowing with love and a sense of purpose so that we cannot help but share it with each other, that confused me. What does that have to do with Jesus' miracle? How does one take a simple, straightforward account of Jesus performing a wondrous miracle and not see that first and foremost, that's the point? What an astounding act of God that only God can perform. Look what Jesus can do. Every miracle is about Jesus and what he does. It's not about us and what he wants us to be or what he wants us to do. It's about him, who he is, what he does, and how he reaches out in his compassion to help his people. So listen to him. The Bible says these things are written so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that by believing may have life in his name. See, it's all about him. Miracles are divine acts, whether it be the feeding of the 5,000 in this account here, or walking on water, or whatever it might be, the healing of people. Miracles are divine acts by which Jesus shows his power as God, and, at least in this one, tests us in our response to him. You could say, he might say, let me test you. And then he says, or asks, what do you see? In this story, the testing begins 
even before the miracle takes place. But before we get to that point, our next hymn, hymn number 411. <coughs>
or that he could get them something for themselves that they wanted. Now think of that. Do you see that as the importance of Jesus in your life? Do you want him to entertain you by what he says or by what he does? Do you come to him because you see him as a means to an end for things that you want for him from life? Those are really wrong motives for seeking Jesus. And he sees right through them. It must hurt him when he sees that people approach him only from that standpoint of what they can get out of him. And yet, he still looks upon them with eyes of <coughs> compassion, as we heard last Sunday, as though these are sheep without a shepherd. The love of our Lord towards us, who can be so often wrong-thinking people, he's willing to teach us. And here was such a teaching opportunity. And it wasn't just for the crowd. It was actually more for the disciples. The crowd had wrong motives, yes. But this was for his disciples. So as the crowd began to arrive, they started down the hill. And he gave the disciples a test to draw out their faith and see what they would say. Now, tests are good things even though you kids might not think they're so great when you have them in school. Tests are good things. They are one of the best ways that a teacher has to seek to measure what the student knows and see what his progress is. They help to reveal a person's level of growth and achievement, and in some ways they protect us from incompetent and reckless people. So Jesus gave his disciples a test to see what they would say, to measure their growth and strengthen them for what soon would be his witnesses in the world. So as the crowd arrives and started up the hill, he comes down to them. And he said to the disciples, look how many there are. How are we going to feed them all? Where are we going to get enough bread for them all to eat. Let me test you and see what you answer to this. Now, he did not really say it that way, but that is his intent. Because this test wasn't for Jesus. He already knew what he was going to do. But he was trying out his disciples to see what kind of response that they might give. It was an exercise for them to learn something about themselves and even more to learn something more about him. And he gave them a good amount of time to stew over the problem because he then went on to teach the people who had come. Okay, so you imagine that you're one of the disciples, one of the twelve, mulling over this problem that Jesus has dumped into your lap. You're listening to him teach. But your eyes keep looking at this great crowd of people that are gathered before you. And soon you begin to figure out that it would take you at least 200 denarii to feed these people. Now I know you don't know what 200 denarii is, but think of it as being about eight months worth of paychecks in order to buy enough food to feed a crowd of this size. Can we do that? You probably think. But you see what Jesus is doing here? He's testing the disciples, giving them time to contemplate the problem that's in front of them. You know, he often does the same thing with us. He tests us over time. He already knows ahead of time what he's going to be doing. But that would not benefit us any if we didn't have to struggle with the problem. Let me test you, he says. Not to harm you, not to make you fail, but to draw out your faith for your advancement and your own safety in faith. You see, dear friends, every test <coughs> that comes from the Lord has a gracious purpose, that we might feel all the more our own inadequacies and need of help, 
and see more clearly his gracious and divine abilities to provide for us. And thus he turns to us, drawing out our faith to rely on him in every matter. Sometimes that takes time. Sometimes it takes lots of time. And he graciously makes use of the time for our learning and benefit. And before we go on, let's join in the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 415. <coughs>
and they have no answers. How often don't you feel that way too, that you have no answers for the obstacles, the situations that can confront you? Maybe you haven't get so worked up about them that you feel like you have nowhere to turn and you simply think, trapped. How am I going to get out of this one? In a sense, that's the way the disciples, and especially Philip, felt. Because when he finally had a chance to give Jesus an answer to the problem, he said, eight months wages, now that's 200 denarii, that wouldn't be enough to pay bread, to buy bread for each one to have just to buy. It. In other words, he was saying, we can't help them. There are times that we don't have enough either. We don't know where it's going to come from. We feel our own inadequacies and our own lack of resources. Though painful, it's not bad for us to be in that spot. Think of it as Jesus testing to see where we will turn for answers. And the answer is always right there. It was right before the disciples. It was in Jesus who can handle every situation. So he said, tell the people to sit down. And they all sat down on the grass. And they all sat in order. Because Jesus is a God of order. He took the boy's bread and fish. He thanked his father, came first of all with a prayer before eating, and all of a sudden there was more than enough for everyone to eat. You see, the answer to the problem was always right in front of their very eyes. It was Jesus. And Christ is beside us all the time. He's with us to the end of the world, he says. So why is it that we worry and fret looking for our own human solutions to problems that we have no answers for? Because he can handle it. He promises, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He invites, cast all your cares upon me, because I care for you. He's strong enough, he's wise enough to do everything and to make it work out. He can handle it. Even our sin. And if he loved us so much that he handled that sin by giving his life for us on the cross and rising again so that we could have that forgiveness, doesn't he love us enough to make everything else turn out for our good too? Thank God that's the Savior we have. It's really so simple. And this story or this account is such an important story about our Savior's saving love and his power to step in in the midst of our own inadequacies. God grant that we don't miss out on that in any type of testing that he gives for Jesus' sake. We join in the singing of our next hymn. You find that as an insert in your bulletin, number 750. <laughs>
And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. And as the ushers come forward to uh, receive the plates to distribute, um, today we'll offer you the opportunity once again to come with any petitions, any prayers that you might like to share. And we'll let you sit and think about that for a while. Uh, we'll have the prayers and the Lord's Prayer more towards the end of the service. As we go on with the next hymns that we'll sing, you might, in those hymns, find a reason for asking a special petition today. So think about that at this time. And now the usher will come forward. Now we'll continue with the singing of our next two hymns. We'll sing them one right after the other. One is in your hymn note 379 for the first one, and the second one is the second hymn in the insert for today.
prayer request for the day. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to uh, say a prayer for my niece and her husband for the loss of their son. And a couple weeks ago, a month ago or something? Yes. And, and your niece's name again? Gina. Okay. Uh, don't be bashful. Yes. Uh, Pastor, uh, I want the congregation to all pray for uh, a member of this congregation, which is also my daughter. Uh, she's struggling with a problem, and it happens to be drugs. And I prayed and prayed, and my prayers alone don't seem to be strong enough for her. So I would hope that you would all help us and join and pray for, 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 for me. Sometimes, like we heard today, the Lord takes time the time of testing to strengthen through that. I'll never lose sight of that, so. In his grace, he helps. Yes? I'd like to pray for my dad, uh, Bill Suter, Audrey, Lois, and anyone who's suffering from illness or pain at this time, Jerry, just all of our members that are not feeling up to par. So we'll include everyone there. Mm -hmm. Especially thinking of those who are going through some very difficult times now. Yeah, thank you. Bring dad. Did he forget his father? No, we also want to say thank you to the Lord for bringing Bob through his surgery. Okay. Bob had surgery on his hip this last week, if you haven't heard. He had a cracked hip and uh, struggling for a while with that. Seems to be getting stronger here. Others? Yes, ma'am. I would like to pray for my family and thank the Lord that they come to visit us and we have a great time together. <laughs> and we'll probably pray for them that they're thankful to be able to come and visit you. <laughs> Others? No? Going once, going twice. Oh, okay. My brother and my sister, we both had cancer. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to pray for my sister, whose daughter committed suicide in April, and she's having a very hard time with it. See, there are a lot of difficulties that go on in life, aren't there? And when those problems confront us, we tend to fail to see Jesus as right there as the answer to us. But sometimes it takes time in order to help let him help us grow. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I would like to also pray for my husband and her Thanksgiving that he is so good for me and his Okay, can we pray for all spouses that way too? Or just for Bob? <laughs> <laughs> okay? So you think on your own too as we pray. Uh, think of the different things you heard in the lessons today. Um, maybe patience at times. Maybe strength at times, and healing too. So, we pray. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are the Lord who watches over all your people. You have given us, your Son, our Savior, to take care of our greatest needs. But there are other needs that confront us daily too. We are happy for that forgiveness and that salvation that Christ has won for us. And we pray that you will strengthen us along the way with all other needs that we have. We pray on behalf of the niece, Jeannie, who has lost the son about a month ago or so, that they would find their peace and their rest in you. They may not find answers to all of the questions that they have, but they find their peace and their joy in you. 
And when one comes to God through faith in Christ, we know that life goes on in heaven above, where the greatest joys will always be experienced. We pray for those who are struggling with the different problems of drugs, alcoholism, whatever it might be, especially thinking of Chris and Dee and their daughter at this time. That is a difficult thing in our world to overcome, and yet you can overcome all things as you work your strength. Um, be with Dee and Chris especially, that uh, they might find their, their strength and their hope in you, and also that uh, uh, Angela would find in Christ the answer to all of her problems, and not in the things of this world. Because as our Savior, you look with compassion upon all your people. Be with the Wisner family too. Grant them a good vacation together. Happiness and knowing that a family uh, is one of the best blessings that you give to us in life. Along with the husbands and the wives that you give to each of us. Uh, we pray on their behalf that you would strengthen them in their love for each other. And their gratefulness to you for the blessings of life under you here in this world. And we still look forward to that greater life which will be above. Be with Lois and her family also, as they have many sicknesses, especially cancer that enters their lives at this point. They need that look of looking to, they need to look to the Savior always, knowing that he will provide them the strength that they need to get by day after day, and that he will be at their side through every difficulty that arises. We also think of all of our members and friends who are ill at this point, in the hospital like Bob, undergoing surgery or have undergone surgery, those who are confronted with family problems, those who are looking for answers to things that they do not know uh, how to deal with. We know that you are the God who looks compassionately again upon his people and you will provide the answers. We thank you for bringing Bob, especially through his surgery at this time, and pray that the doctors and nurses who take care of him will also provide, be your ways to provide the means for for his uh, recovery, if that is according to your will. But above all, we know that we always rest in your hands so we can be safe in every circumstance. Suicide is a difficult thing, O oh Lord, to uh, deal with, and yet you provide the comfort and the assurance to your people that you are with them in every circumstance. There is no sin that is not forgiven before you because Christ died for all sin. It's only that the lack of unbelief, or lack of faith, being in unbelief, that would ever separate us from you. So give the family, give Sharon especially uh, that faith in you, knowing that you work all things for the good of your people in every trying situation that may come. And we ask dear Lord that you would be with us all today, whether we are traveling or whether we are just at home, that your angels would guard and protect us, that your spirit would guide us, and that you would give us the peace and confidence in you, knowing that we can rely on you for all things. And now hear us as we come to you with all of our requests in the prayer that you yourself have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.